What's up, guys? Tristan and Tony here at the Zero Duck 30 podcast. Uh, so if you've been following us for a while, you know that the app we love to use for all of our GPS and hunt planning and all that good stuff is the HuntWise app. And the HuntWise app is allowing us to give a 20% discount to all of our followers. Uh, Tony, why don't you tell them about how they can find that discount and um, apply it? Yeah. So um, all you got to do is go to the App Store, download HuntWise, uh, try it for free. I keep saying that. <laughs> but you can put in code DUCK30 and get 20% off the Elite and the Pro versions. If you guys haven't checked out our podcast from last week with Nate, um, I, I can't imagine why you would use another product. So <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, DUCK30 is the code. Heck yeah. So uh, today we got on Cade Weatherford, the owner of Delta Thunder Outfitters. And if you guys have followed us for a while, you've seen our YouTube videos with Cade and uh, we've had some good times to say the least. <laughs> so with that, with that being said, uh, Cade, why don't you tell them a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do? <laughs> well, um, so I'm a waterfowl guide out here in northeast Arkansas. Um, I've been guiding for roughly oh, a little over 10 years now. And uh, we I started out guiding waterfowl. I was just guiding uh, duck, duck hunts and uh and then it kind of, a uh, couple of few years ago, the duck hunting got really slow here. So I kind of transitioned over to speckle belly and uh, speckle belly and snow goose hunts. And now we're guiding pretty much everything. We got early teal, we got speck, we got snow goose, duck, pretty much everything that you can hunt that's got wings. It's waterfowl. <laughs> I mean, uh, you name it, we hunt it. Uh, Heck yeah! Yeah, and you guys right. will have to have to have to forgive us. You know, Kate is is busy and he's uh out. He's actually in his tractor right now. So literally, yeah, uh, I'm getting beat up actually currently. At the moment. Uh, <laughs> no, that's all part of it. Yep, yep. So, um, in Delta Thunder, how many years you guys have been in business now? You'll be going your fourth year is that right this will be this will be year number four yep near, near this, number four. this coming season it'll be year number four so now look, i i said a little while ago i got it for i've got it for 10 years i got it for another guy for a long time and then like i said when i started doing when i started doing the the goose hunts he didn't do goose hunts and i needed to make some extra money and there wasn't nobody coming duck hunting because it was just really poor so I started guiding goose hunts. I didn't have a name, didn't have an outfitter, didn't have, I was just some people that came duck hunting with me years and years ago. Uh, I called them up and I was like, hey, you guys interested in coming and shooting speckle bellies? And they were like, yeah. And uh, we started hammering them. And, uh, <laughs> and it just kind of, I kind of like, I didn't really start an outfitter. Like I was just trying to make a little bit of money on the side and, Finally, one day somebody asked me, what do you call yourself? And my Instagram name at the time was Dead End Outdoors. So we were calling that. Well, my my, my grandfather, he makes uh, duck calls. And the name of his duck call company is Delta Thunder Duck Calls. And we, we kind of got to guiding. I went with the Dead End Outdoors thing for a while. And uh, um, it just kind of like... I don't know. It got serious. Uh, we started getting a lot more people and I was like, I, I'm like dead end outdoors. It sounds kind of like a copycat, you know, cause uh -huh. there was, there was a lot of, I, I Googled the name and like, there's a few like deer hunting outfitters that are called that and everything. Oh, gotcha. And I was like, okay, nobody's got the name Delta Thunder. So uh, I asked my granddaddy if I could, you know, if I could, use that name he didn't care so we rolled with that uh and uh yeah yeah one thing led to another we ended up i was just doing it on the side to make some extra money and then we ended up guiding just like that <laughs> just like that <laughs> okay. and i'd always wonder where the delta thunder came from so that's funny I, and i remember you telling us in the duck blind about your uh, granddaddy's calls we still need to get uh get some from them 
Yeah, they're they're really not. And I'm not I'm not trying to give you a sales pitch either, but mm-hmm. they're nice. And when I say they're nice, like they're like really, he sells duck calls that you don't take to the you don't put it on your lanyard and take a duck hunt. Mm-hmm. You really you just hold it back and and hold on to it because he makes his calls out of bodock wood or what they call osage orange and what's so special about that wood is is you can't just take a bodock tree and cut it down it takes about it takes about a hundred hundred years to 150 years for the wood to dry out wow oh my gosh so like if me and you wanted to make some and we didn't have any wood we'd cut it down there there's no way we could build one in our lifetime so how did he go about getting his hands on some of that wood? Like, did he think well, about this years well, ago? Well, his granddad's 175 years old. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> did well, you know that? <laughs> so right here in Arkansas, along 49 Highway, it mm-hmm. runs from it runs from right here where I live at in Jonesboro mm-hmm. to all the way to Brinkley, Arkansas, which is about 72 miles. And there's a railroad track that goes right alongside of the of the highway. Uh-huh. And in between that railroad track and that highway, there used to be a that highway used to not be there. It used to be an old dirt wagon trail. And they had a fence that went all the way alongside of that railroad track back in the eighteen hundreds. Okay. Hmm. And they had that fence there to keep the cows off the railroad tracks. And uh, he was, there was a guy that lives down there by him. I'm not exactly sure where at, but he lived down there by him somewhere. I know his last name was Taylor because he made tailor-made custom calls. Wow. And, <laughs> That's uh, funny. But Mr. Taylor would pay my granddaddy money to go get some of those fence posts. And that was back in the... 50s probably when he was doing that Mm -hmm. and if you look up a taylor duck call a taylor made duck call online right now his acrylic ones go and mr taylor's dead his acrylic ones are about a thousand dollars wow right now just the for the his bodoc ones go from anywhere from 1500 to 3500 dollars wow now is i was just gonna ask is that i mean has that company like lived on or pretty much those calls were made? No, Mr. T- Mr. Taylor died and, mm-hmm. and that was it. I mean, okay. it's kind of like, I don't like back then it ain't, things weren't commercialized like they are right now. Like, you know how you got R and T, you got echo, you yeah. got duck commander, you got all the buck Gardner, you got all these brand names and stuff. Right. Well, back then it was kind of like, you know, people made duck people made duck calls. I mean, all kinds of people made duck calls, and they just sold them right out of their house. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it, it's kind of like uh, the best thing I can compare it to is the fur bear market. You know, mm-hmm. people trading fur bears way back in the day for things. You know, mm-hmm. for food, for gunpowder, for whatever. You know, you uh, trade. That's the best thing I can compare it to. Huh. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah, so you've been in business now for four years. And so let's kind of roll in. And uh, I think our viewers would like to know, you know, how did how did Zero Duck 30 and and Delta Thunder Hour or Delta Thunder Outfitters connect, you know, and y'all probably won't believe it. But uh, I remember exactly how. Well, I do. I'm just saying yeah. it, it's a it's a, a rather different experience. So, yeah. Um, so here we were uh, a couple years back, and we wanted to go hunt Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And and to make a long story short, y'all, um, part of it was is that, hey, we wanted to experience it not just on public land, but also on private land. Mm-hmm. And so we can get the full experience. Well, we're just like all y'all. You know, we're not made of money, you know? And so we're trying to look for somebody that's not the highest end, you know, you know, but not the the lowest end either. And uh, we just saw that Kate was advertising his business, and Tristan um, set it up, and uh, we went out there to hunt two days with him. And um, 
Take it from there, Tristan. Well, no, I was just going to say, I remember we found uh, Cade originally on Venku. Yeah. Is how we uh, connected with Cade, and uh, we went out there for a goose and duck hunt, but anyway. Yeah, so we, we went out to hunt public land in Arkansas, but we also wanted to hunt that. But the other thing, there, and honestly, this was one of the re- main reasons for us, is that we come from such a deep root of hunting that we really wanted to get to know some people. Honestly, I mean, we were just like, you know, I'm sure there's good, good folks out there. And, and that's part of what we love about the sport of hunting is, is getting out and meeting the community, understanding what their, their culture is, you know, uh, just like we, if you watched our video about the, the, um, the, uh, chocolate gravy, we had yeah. never even seen such a thing and, uh, just stuff like that, you know? Uh-huh. And so we went out and hunted with Cade and, uh, me, Tristan and Michael, and guys, you can do everything right, but the ducks gotta be there, mm-hmm. you know. And that's the bottom line, and and that's what we kind of experienced, you know. We uh, it was very cool for us because uh, Michael got his first duck that he'd yeah, ever got. He got a gadwall and a ring neck that day. Yeah, on that day, and you know what? That was a success. That was a win for us. We were like. We were so stoked about that, you know. Oh yeah. And uh, and Cade was like, "Man, I'm sorry, it's slow and everything." I, you know, and we're just so realistic because we've been hunting for years, uh, deer, and I've been part of outfitting got, you know. And sometimes you you can do everything right and it just doesn't work out. And uh, we went out and goose hunted. And he can't control the geese either, you know. They they just didn't want to come in. They were acting spooky and stuff. And uh, and that was our first experience with Delta Thunder Outfitters. You know? It was also a very, very, very bad year. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Well, no, it was, and that's that's the thing is that, and well, it wasn't like it was just here. It was everywhere, everywhere, everywhere right? Mm-hmm. And here's the thing is that not once were we discouraged mm-hmm. or upset or felt like we didn't get our money's worth. Because here's what he did: we didn't get him in the morning, and Kate said. Hey, we're going right back out and we're going to go goose hunting. So he tried to change it up. He did everything within his control as an outfitter to put us in the best position to be successful. And that's all you can ask for an outfitter. And so part of what I wanted to talk about today, um, and, and we'll get into it in a little bit, is reasonable expectations for people that are going to Arkansas. It does not mean if you go to Arkansas, you're going to leave with limits, guys. It, I don't care where you go, mm-hmm. unless you want to pull about a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a day. Yeah. Now, if you want to do that, there's some operations out there you can do that with. Um, not us average guys, you know. We just want to go out and have a good experience. But here's the here's the 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 coolest dynamic of it all. We did that. And if you guys have watched our videos from this year, we shot the shit out of them. <laughs> All right? I mean, we did. We did. We shot the shit out of them. And guess what? The, the, the environment was right. Mm-hmm. We saw that change overnight in the month of January. Yep. It did. It flipped like a coin. And if you watch our four-man limit video, that's when it started. Pretty much a couple days before that, because Kate told me they were shooting shit out of him a couple days before that. Uh, but from that point on, stuff changed, and we had all of the right pieces to have these ducks in this area. Water flooding, temperature, freezing, all these other pieces that we learned a lot about that, folks, you need to learn a lot about before you just expect to go out and shoot ducks with an outfitter. You know. But here, here's, here's the, the nutshell of it all. Even though we went out the first time and didn't I have a great experience with Cade, the friendship that we have is priceless. Oh, yeah. It's priceless, man. And we could have went out all year this year Mm -hmm. and had a terrible hunt every time. But I'm going to tell you guys what. If you're around the three of us long enough, and I mean three of us, I'm talking about Cade on the phone, too, we have a good time. (laughs) We have a good time. And if you're in the blind with Cade, I guarantee you, you're going to laugh. And that's just... As long as you're not a stick in the mud. As yeah. long as you're not a stick in the mud. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to kind of break into that a little bit and talk about our history and uh, how we got connected, you know. And if we would have been assholes and went out there, well, eh, well, we didn't shoot our limits. We would have never had this great relationship that we have now. Sure. You know, and I mean, we, 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 we talk about getting together for deep sea fishing to 
whatever, you know, and, and those kinds of relationships, folks, they're genuine and they're priceless. For sure. So make sure that you don't miss that part of your trip. Yeah. You know, as well said. Uh, and man, I looking back on it, like, uh, especially that four man limit day, man. <laughs> I remember, so we were going to get out there like, you know, normal duck hunting time. And I remember, uh, the weather was like shit and we're like, dude, I don't know. And Cade rode us out on the side by side, me grinder and Cade, we rode out there and Cade, it was like a tornado, wasn't it? <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> Bro, my truck, oh, yeah. I was sitting in the truck while you guys were doing that. If you guys watch the video, it looks like a lightning bolt. Almost hit, almost hit the side by side. Um, but, dude, it was rocking my truck. It was nuts. And I'm like, oh, that was crazy, crazy day. But, you know, most people wouldn't have went out and did it. Well, hey, um, could you guys hold up just one minute? You bet. Let's yeah. take a break, and we'll be right back. Yep. Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, Kate had a little uh, uh, technical issue with the tractor I had to take care of, so <laughs> no problem. But uh, no, we were talking about the the weather that day on the four-man limit. If you guys watch that video, it's crazy. It really is crazy. Um, Tristan even threw up um, on a dark sky what the weather was doing that day. But what's interesting is, you know, I was talking about how there's so many factors that got to happen, you know, no matter where you go, no matter what field you lease, whatever. So I thought it'd be kind of cool today if Cade talked about what happened with the weather that day, or he maybe even leading up to that day because you guys shot him good the day before what led up to that and why it changed. Because that field was one that I remember you telling me it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And it wasn't that great earlier in the season, but it got hot. And let's talk about why. Go ahead, Kate. Well, um, so why it got hot. So right next to it is a big cypress slough. It's on some private property. Uh, the guys that own it don't hunt that part of that cypress slough. And uh, so it's basically, it's a refuge. So like those ducks can flip flop over from that field to that, uh, that, pond right there or that slough right there where they know they're safe uh and the ducks early season uh were stale i mean they'd been shot at they i mean been hunted every day uh if, to have good success the more pushes of birds you get meaning the more new birds that you get coming in from the north or south it doesn't matter east west whatever uh the more new birds you get coming in the better your success is going to be because those ducks have not seen your decoy spread. They haven't seen your mojo. They ain't heard your duck call. I mean, there's a lot of factors there, but, uh, for whatever reason, that one in particular field, whenever it rains, uh, we hunt that same field for early teal. And even when early teal season's in, for whatever reason, when it rains, those ducks just become more, active uh on that that in particular uh field right there um and that's not a factor that you'd put in on just any field it's just that in particular spot you know i mean every other duck field that i lease you know we got seven fields we lease the other six of them you could have a pretty day see the best conditions to me for hunting ducks is a bluebird day. You got about a 10 mile an hour wind out of the north and you just got a big cold front, sun shining. I mean, that right there is like the best day to kill migrating birds for ducks, for snow geese, for whatever. And it's cold and they're wanting to feed. Uh, that That's what you're wanting. Uh, and even on days like that, you don't, you know, you could go out to that pit and not kill nothing, and the next day it could be getting hotter and be overcasty and just nothing seems right. You go out there and slay it. <laughs> and for whatever reason, just that's how that, that's just how a duck works. I mean, I tell people this all the time: you cannot predict a duck. I don't care who you are; you cannot predict a duck. You can make an assumption. <laughs> mm -hmm. and sometimes those assumptions are right mm -hmm. but you cannot predict a duck yeah i believe that 
<laughs> because I'm sure I have tried to predict the duck a lot of times in my life, and uh, I think I've spent a lot of money and time uh, <laughs> wasted. <laughs> but we all do. That's what we chase after. Is you know we chase after those days like that. So that that morning, the storm front rolls in, and it was such a timing thing, in my opinion, because here this thunderstorm rolls in. We happened to just say, okay, we're going to wait another 20 minutes. And we sat there and we were ready to go. And as soon as that, wa- and Cade called it. He said, as soon as that rain stops, it's going to be on. Mm-hmm. And that rain stopped and we rode out there and side by side. <laughs> at daylight. At, at daylight. Yeah. And there was ducks all over the field and they were jumping up. But w- when you're where they want to be, it don't matter. It, it now, don't- you remember what happened. You remember exactly what happened. Let me just let me just clear this up. This is what <laughs> yeah. happened. Yep, yep. I wanted to go to Waffle House, and you yeah. were going home about going duck hunting. <laughs> that's yeah, right. That's right. right. That's right. And I said we're not going to shoot any until about nine o'clock. <laughs> and we went and sat in the rain for two hours, and then about nine o'clock it cleared up, and it was a, it was a slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. By eleven, we were done. Yep. Just about. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that was a great day. But, uh, but Cade, you know, one of the other things I want to talk about today, and, and this isn't specific to you, but it applies to you and every other outfitter out there is, you know, I see it happen all, all the time. Guys, if you're going out and you're going to a, an outfitter, they're working for you. They cannot control the ducks. They can't laser beam them in. Mm-hmm. You got a guide out there working for you. He deserves a tip. Period. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you shoot some ducks. The more you shoot, the more gracious you're going to be with your money. <laughs> uh, uh, of course that. But just remember that it's not like a restaurant, you guys. It's not like you can order uh, a meal and you expect your steak to come out just like you ordered it. Right. That's not the way how duck hunting works. And I, honestly, you know, I outfitted and, and guided for deer for years. It doesn't work that way either, you know, unless you go in a closed fence place. But, um, but guys, I wanted to bring that up because I've seen, I seen it firsthand this year. Um, even guys that got good hunts that don't tip your guys, a dime. not a dime. Yeah. And you need to be approaching it. These guys work for a living, and I have yet to meet an outfitter that didn't have somebody traveling as a guide to come hunt with, you know, to come guide for them. And so they've got expenses, you know, and uh, and, and things to try to take care of. It's not like, you know, somebody's trying to charge you extra. Right. You know, you're paying for the effort of the person that's trying to help you have a good hunt. Yeah, you got to keep in mind, like, these guys are brushing in blinds. These guys are laying out decoys so you don't have to do a damn thing when you show up. They're re- filling up the f- side-by-sides with gas. They're getting the trailers on the truck. Breaking the ice. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's the list goes on and on and it's you kind of sometimes it's easy to forget about those things, but I'm just saying you know it's important to keep those at the front of your mind when, you know, you're going with an outfitter, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Um well, you know, with that said, you know, Let's talk about, you know, obviously, okay, let's talk about what you're doing now. You know, we all just show up during duck season and, oh, I want a flooded field. <laughs> what does it take all year long to make that happen? Cade's a farmer too, so talk about it. Well, uh, so like right now, uh, you know, farming's the main commodity. A lot of people don't know that, you know, they think that just, uh, all you do is you come to Arkansas, you flood a field, you put a duck pit in it, the ducks just rain glory on it, you know. <laughs> but it doesn't really, it doesn't really uh, work out like that. It uh, it doesn't work out uh, like that at all, actually. Because um, I can take you to some fields that people have, and that's another thing. You go to lease a field, you got to be really careful who you lease from, because I know people that will literally flood a field that I've never seen a duck in. They'll flood the field and they'll lease it out to somebody that's out of state that doesn't know anything, ain't never been around this area, don't know any better, 
and they'll pay five, six, seven thousand dollars to have a, you know, they'll be sitting in that pit all year and won't kill a duck, mm. won't see a duck. Wow. Uh, but that the reason them ducks are out here in these fields is is because there's food. Um, right now we're prepping all of our. We're about a month behind, so everything that we're doing right now, like I'm working up dirt right now. Um, everything that I'm doing right now should have been done about a month ago. Mm. And it's not like everybody's slacking or anything. It's just because it has rained here. Literally, it rained the whole month of April, at least every other day. Wow. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much rainfall we got in April, but it was enough to just, you couldn't get in the field. You can't do nothing. Uh, and then I know, you know, whoever's listening to this podcast, it might be one of the farmers up north that are like, well, why don't you no-till it? Well, when you cut this rice, it, it, rice fields have got water on it all year. The whole time it's growing, it's got water on it. When you go in to, when you go in to harvest it, that water was just drained off of it, and sometimes it'll be dry, but a lot of times it'll have a lot of muddy spots in it, and you're going to make ruts with a combine and the tractors and everything. You're going to make ruts when you're taking the crop out of the field. So we have to we have to prep the dirt every year in order to get a good seed bed and uh, and uh, and smooth everything out where the water can evenly broadcast across the field. Mm. So, uh, but it, no, it, it takes a lot more than just flooding a duck a field. You know, you can't just flood some random field. There's those ducks got to have a legitimate reason in there, and uh, that and you got to be in a good flyway. You want to be near, you know, it, right here, uh, the where I live at. You got Crowley's Ridge. It runs through Jonesboro, and uh, those ducks stay in between Crowley's Ridge and Black River which you guys are familiar with Black River. You've hunted on Dave Donaldson and mm. everything like that. You go any further east or west of that little, yeah, that little, if you look at it on the map, it looks like a, like a trend. It's literally, it's like two lines. If mm. you're anywhere east or west of those two lines, you're not going to see any ducks. You might see a few, but mm. you're not going to see any. Until you get over, if you go east, you're not going to see any until you get close to the Mississippi River. Mm-hmm. You go you go west, you're not going to see any until you get over the mountains, uh, until you get over the Ozark Mountains and stuff. And they might have some ducks, you know, that cross from uh, one flyway to another that come across those mountains. I know some people that, that duck hunt up in the mountains around here, and but they don't kill them anywhere it's nothing compared to what we kill them like here in the Delta. Mm-hmm. I mean, like they, they have a day where they kill two or three ducks. They've had a great day. I mean, they've had a wonderful day. Wow. 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 So this, let's, let's talk about this past year, Cade. So this past year, um, and it was really cool to watch this whole thing develop because we did spend a lot of time in Arkansas this year. And, and um, you know, the first split was hard. The second split was hard. And then, and I think there's a lot of people in, at least Northeast Arkansas would say, mm-hmm. the doors of heaven opened yeah. for the last month of well, the season. Well, it depends on how you want to cut the pie. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right, the whole right. season was not easy. No. We killed ducks. We killed, we killed a bunch of ducks. Killed more ducks this year than I ever have, independently. Mm-hmm. Uh, as an independent outfitter, I killed more ducks than I ever have this past year, but it was not a, it was actually the hardest year out of all of them. Um, early season, it was drought. It would not rain. It was, uh, here. We, in the, in the Delta here, we have what they call gumbo dirt and that dirt when it's wet, it's wet. I mean, it'll hold water. But if there's no water underneath the soil for it to hold water on the top of the soil, then it just soaks right in like a sponge. Mm. And 
it was dry. We pumped water on our duck fields. It hold water for maybe two days and then it soak right back up. Well, then what you got to do is, is, and you guys know how expensive diesel is now. Um, it wasn't as expensive, but it was still expensive. <clears throat> you got to put diesel in all the wells to pump it, to pump water. And, uh, that's what we were having to do. We were having to pretty much pump diesel. I mean, all the time because it would not hold water. You could pump. You're literally with, with the with the whale. You're taking water from the ground and putting it on top of the ground. Mm. So it's just cycling right back. We'd pump it on top and it just it soak right back through. Wow. And, and it would go to the bottom. So it was like that. Pretty much, it was like that. I mean, I had some fields that were mud. We couldn't even hunt them. Mm-hmm. I was canceling people, tell them not to come. And uh, I had, luckily, I, I we've got some fields that are just, it's really, really, really wet dirt. Even when, you're in, when it's in drought, mm-hmm. uh, those fields are muddy. Uh, and luckily, I had a couple fields that had that really heavy dirt in it. And it was holding water, and we were able to hunt. But uh, that, that's another factor. You know, you got to have all, you got to have Mother Nature working with you. And then you got to have the duck migration working with you. And at that time, in November and early December, I had neither one of them working for me. Yeah. We could not get a rain. Uh, and finally, right there around, right before Christmas, right before you guys came and filmed the four-man hunt, mm-hmm. uh, we got a little bit of a rain, and it put some water in the ground, and then we were able to pump what water we were pumping on on top of it, then it finally held. Mm. you know where it wouldn't soak in the dirt right mm-hmm. um so then i mean we had water but all the ducks that we had were just stale ducks they were ducks that had been here since the first week of season that had been shot at that had seen everybody's decoys knew where everybody was hunting i mean it, it was it was hard. Nobody was killing ducks around me. Mm-hmm. And then it seemed like it literally seemed like maybe two or three days before you guys filmed that video, uh, it started to kick on. We started killing instead of killing three or four, we were killing ten or twelve. And like I know that's not a very high number to a group of people, but I mean it was really good compared to what we were doing, and I was really happy with it. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, that way, the guys that are coming out here and paying money to hunt this, you know, they're shooting some ducks. It's better than not shooting any. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, you know, we were killing a few, and then we it, it went from 12 to 15 to 15 to 20. I mean, we started killing them like that. And I was like, all right, yeah. You know, I remember <laughs> my guide, Hunter Frame, he came in one day. I asked him, he came in the lodge, and I asked him, I said, well, how'd you do? He said, we killed 22. I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah, we killed 22. I said, no way. He said, I swear to you. Uh, he, I, went and looked at the, I went and looked at them guys out there that was uh, hunting with him, and they were grinning ear to ear. And they were, yeah, man, we killed them good. We got a gab ball. We got a, we got a mallard. We got a spoonbill. We got some teal. I'm like, great, guys. And I took their pictures and everything. And, uh and then the next day you know uh you guys came we went and hunted that same pit i didn't have nobody hunting that day we came and hunted that pit and uh and it just it turned i mean the, it just cranked up uh-huh and i mean but i tell you right i mean it can crank up fast but it can also slow down immediately you know usually you can tell when you're starting to get a push, when you, when you get a, I mean, that's how I could tell we were getting a push of birds. When we went, when we just had a, like a little spike in numbers mm-hmm. uh, and we killed a few more and then we killed even more. I'm like, yeah, we're getting a good push. Now the heart <laughs> of the push is getting there. And it kind of like, if I remember correctly, the weather was getting cold up North in like Northern Missouri, Northern Illinois, Central vortex. Illinois. And, and it started pushing the ducks really good south our way, and uh, and we started killing some. But I tell you, the only thing that bothered me about that, and it still bothers me, is 
is we got a push. We shot ducks really good. And, but I still, we still did not see the amount of birds that I've seen my whole life. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm. I, I, when you guys filmed that, that last hunt and we saw all them ducks, I knew you, I know you guys thought it was amazing, but yeah, when I was, when I was 10 or 12 years old, 13, 14, 15, even that, that's how it was all the time. I mean, it didn't matter what the weather would do. There was always that amount of ducks around. Wow. And I mean, it is, uh, I can tell you the change that has happened over the last five years i mean it is it is uh it has changed dramatically i mean what the difference is from then to now wow yeah and that's a i mean when you start to think about i mean you know a lot of factors affect affecting that but man it's from the outside looking in you know you hear all these different things i mean what do you think are some of the main things affecting that Cade? Like, I think it's because, uh, uh, it's because duck hunting is more commercialized. Mm -hmm. I noticed that right after, uh, duck dynasty got big or whatever, like there was a lot more people that were involved in duck hunting and, why I say that is, is because I was, I was just scrolling through Facebook, you know, uh, and seeing people that I know that live here in Arkansas that have never duck hunt, that never shot a gun mm -hmm. that were going duck hunting. You know, they were mm -hmm. saying, well, we're going duck hunting with so-and-so mm -hmm. and just a lot more people. I think they encouraged a lot more people, which is great. I'm not, you know, some people say, well, them Duck Dynasty guys, they screwed the duck hunt up. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely fantastic to introduce everybody to the sport that me and you love. Sure. And, and that way they can get a real idea on what it's really about, even if they try and, and they don't like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they just know the reality of what it, what duck hunting's really about, you know, yep. I mean, uh, they're going to, you know, they're going to, that, that's just going to make it better for the waterfowl industry mm -hmm. and at the same time, getting more people involved with duck hunting, you're going to get more people that are hunting. So the mm -hmm. hunting pressure nationwide mm -hmm. is going to go up mm -hmm. and, and that's the big thing that I, I think that factored, uh, that, that really got, uh, waterfowl hunting just pumped up you know uh and, and it got it just seemed like it just i don't know if it's coincidence or what it is but it's just funny to me that right when the duck dynasty thing got big a lot more people started hunting and at the same time the hunting got worse you know it, or it didn't it didn't get worse but it got it got harder you mm. know it wasn't as easy as it has been when uh it's not as easy now compared to it when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Well, because I've heard people say that before. And I also heard you say the reality of hunting. And that's one thing we always try to talk about. And like one story I always tell was when my buddy Austin got his first model duck mm -hmm. here in Georgia. And, you know, well, I mean, everybody knows like a model duck's a cool thing because you can't shoot them in like Mississippi Flyway or any other Flyway, really, unless you're in like Texas or something. Or Louisiana. Louisiana, or something. yeah. And uh, we that was the only duck we shot that day, but it was just like it's one of those things when you have a when you like kind of level your expectation to like the reality of what's going on. Like, hey, we might not shoot limits, but it would be pretty damn cool if we shot you know, a mallard, get your first mallard, your first mallard. Whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever. It's no different than when you take somebody out and, you know, like I remember taking Tristan out his first time hunting and mm -hmm. why does it everybody, why is it okay that everybody on Facebook or Instagram, social media, whatever, if a kid shoots a little spike buck. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. But if a 50 year old guy like me shows up with a spike buck, and I'm excited and happy as hell. 
It's not going to work out Dude, that I way. Don't, I don't give a damn. I'll shoot a spike. I want that meat, boy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. But not to get off track. But, yeah. Um, but, no, it, it, you know, it has changed. There's no doubt about it. I mean, if you're in tune with duck hunting, everybody's trying to put their finger on it. Mm -hmm. You know, and my opinion and my observation has been this from seeing it state to state, whatever, is that it sure the hell matters where you are. And, and not just, you know, everybody says you got to be on the X. Well, in order to be on the X, you got to be around the, like Cade was talking about that migration path, you know, that's the first step, you know, and then you got to provide the habitat for them. And then they got to, you can have the habitat all day long. I don't know how many times I've been out scouting and found so much great conditions for ducks and there's places I've hunted for three years and I still can't believe yeah. that ducks don't go there, you know, but for whatever reason they don't, you know, so, um, cool stuff. Um, I need to take a break and we're going to come right back. But the reality of hunting is I have to go pee. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. So, um, you know, we were previously talking a little bit. I'd asked Kate a little bit, like, what does it take to pre prepare these fields and stuff for duck season? You know, and while we were off camera, we were just talking about it's really not about getting the fields ready for duck season. It's getting the fields ready to harvest, <laughs> Yeah. you know, and and the duck migration obviously falls into that. Um, what I've gathered from Cade so far is that, you know, at least up in their area and their specific area, and it could change, you know, 10 acres or 10 miles one way or the other. But where he's at right now, basically everything's about a month behind. So, Cade, just talk about the farming aspect of it, and what are you guys doing? Uh, what do you do to try to speed up the process, if there's anything you can do, and, and uh, what you're going to do to try to get that rice prepped? Well, so, like you said, everything's a month behind uh, because it, we've had so much rain. I think I said that already mm -hmm. in the podcast, but I'll say it again. We've had all this rain, and uh, so what we got to do is, is basically we're trying to do a month's worth of work a lot quicker, like in a week. Mm. So we're spending a lot longer hours on a tractor. That's why I'm on, you know, I'm on here, right. I'm driving a tractor right now talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we're spending a lot more time out here in the field instead of going home at dark. We're staying to two, three o'clock, four o'clock sometimes in the morning, trying to get everything planted and back on schedule. Uh, and how that affects the duck hunting is, is, if there's no crops in the field, there's no, you know, we harvest it. And yeah, when we harvest it, you'll get most of the grain out of the field, but you're not going to get all of it. There's what, going to be some that the wind blows off and stuff like that. What's the main and, month that you harvest? Well, rice could be anywhere from August to October, okay, depending on what variety you have planted. And uh, soybeans is typically, well, same deal. It's kind of whatever variety you got planted. Like right here, the soybeans, the type of variety of soybeans that we grow, typically it'll be October or November, early November when we're cutting uh, soybeans. But if you go 45 minutes to the east of where I live right here, those guys will plant an earlier variety because they're in sandier dirt. And they'll be cutting them in September, mm, huh. you know, and, uh, Interesting. Uh, but, but what affects, you know, what affects that, you know, what, what, so the preparation, we got to work the dirt up. We got to get everything. Uh, we irrigate everything in our state. You know, if you go to Illinois or, you know, Indiana, anywhere, anywhere else, but here. They can literally, they can work some dirt up. Sometimes they don't even have to do that. They can, they can drill right over the top of the last year's crop and it'll grow. Well, here, our soil just doesn't have that talent. Mm -hmm. um, it, it cannot, you, you can't just drill into the top of it, mainly because it's like concrete. When it's, when it's dry, it's like concrete. Mm. And you got to work it up and get it fluffy in order to get that seed in the ground. Mm. Interesting. Um, so we'll work it up and then we'll plant it. And, uh, 
and then we'll when it when rice when it typically when it gets from four to six inches tall we'll we pull what we call levees some people call them dikes but that's really not the term for them they're called levees we'll pull levees through the fields and uh and we'll use a system of levees to flood the the rice you know we'll turn the well on the well will flood the water on top of the rice and uh and uh and it'll that rice will be in two to three to four inches of water the whole time it's growing until it's ready to harvest Mm. when it's when it's reached maturity and it's ready to to come out of the field um we'll drain we'll, we'll turn the well off we'll pull the drains you know we'll open the drains up it'll drain all of it out of the field and and then it'll be ready to cut you try to get it as dry as you can but i mean typically you're you're just you're not gonna you're not gonna it's gonna be muddy it's gonna be sloppy it's it's just that's just how it's gonna be that's the life uh, life of a, a rice farmer huh <laughs> right right i mean i had I, I brought a college professor one time out here to ride the combine with me one year. He'd moved from Tennessee and was an ag teacher up here at Arkansas State University. And he wanted to see, you know, how rice is harvested. And I said, well, that's perfect. It was the fall, you know, and I brought him out here and uh, he rode the combine with me. And we were going through some really muddy stuff and I was just whipping it back and forth and just trying to get it you know getting a straight line where i could cut in a straight line and he was you know getting jerked around in the little in the trainer seat right beside me and uh he was like man this is not easy is it and i was like no (laughs) he said uh is it is it typically is it typically like this i'm like this is what we do all day long (laughs) this is how it is uh one thing i was wondering kate is so, like, in the Midwest, like, for, like in Illinois, where we're from originally, you know, they rotate um, fields for, you know, I guess just the natural, like, nutrition of the dirt or whatever. With right. with rice, how does it work as far as, like, making sure there's enough nutrition in the dirt for, like, the stuff to grow year after year? Like, do you have to rotate fields, or how does that work? No, yeah, we do rotate fields. Mm-hmm. Um, we rotate fields. Um uh, Rice requires a lot of potash, mm-hmm. and uh, in order to cut cost on potash, I'll, I'll just tell you about the cost real quick. Mm-hmm. So this time last year, potash was about three hundred and thirty dollars a ton. Mm-hmm. You put about a ton on every two acres. Okay. Right now in twenty twenty two, it's about eleven hundred dollars a ton. God. Just to tell you the the price difference, wow. just to give you a good uh, how dramatically the price has changed for That's that. Nuts. So, um, but to really before the price shot up, people around here about ten years ago figured out that uh, when they fertilize their corn. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you fertilize corn, you're giving your, your soil enough uh, nutrition and stuff and a good pH level and everything mm-hmm. to where if you rotate, if you do your first year in a field in soybeans, if you do one year soybeans to give the corn a good rotation, you get do one year soybeans and then two years corn, you know, you do back to back corn on that fourth year, you can grow really good rice. Huh. And uh Interesting. and it, you know, you think, well, well it takes four years to to get a good rice crop. I mean, is it worth it? And really, yes it is. Um you know, if you do right a lot of people for years, forever, for my whole life, they've rotated it. It's been rice, beans, rice, beans, rice, beans. Some years it'll be beans, rice, rice beans rice rice you know they'll rotate it just like that Mm -hmm. uh and it just depends on how good your dirty is it depends on where you're at down here in the in the river bottoms where we farm at some of these fields will be in rice forever we won't rotate them at all 
Mm. And we just got to put a ton of fertilizer on it, potash, and, and just hope that it grows. And then some years, uh, if the rice don't do good, then we'll leave it out of production for a year and just, you know, plant a cover crop on it, which you plant a cover crop on it, it's not going to do very good. Mm-hmm. Um, you plant a cover crop on it, it's not going to do very good. And, uh, and it'll drown out, but it'll still give it enough to where you can go back to planting rice on it. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool, cool. All right, I need to take one more break, and All then right, I man. swear we'll be done. All righty. All right. No problem. Hey, guys, we're back. Hey, uh, so what we're going to do is throw you a little bit of curveball. We're going to uh, end the episode here. Cade, actually, you know, it's real life. He's out there farming tonight and uh, ran in some issues with the tractor and he's got to take care of it so oh as they say god family business right so <laughs> anyway he's got to take care of that and and uh and, and get the job done tonight so uh, we're gonna end it there but uh stay tuned because we're gonna come back with this joker for part two <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you guys viewing it. uh tristan where can everybody find us at yeah you can find us at zero duck 30 on all the social media platforms and then uh on youtube as well and um appreciate you guys tuning in and uh yeah part two will be uh at some point <laughs> yeah if you guys want to book a hunt with delta thunder outfitters you can find them at delta thunder outfitters uh you can find them on instagram tiktok and facebook mm-hmm. uh kate is always very clear that he does not take any calls until when is it i want to say june 1st or july 1st i don't know let's just go with july 1st yeah. since it's later <laughs> so anyway but uh uh but you guys definitely gotta dial him up go check out the videos and yeah. uh, you'll see what uh it's all about yeah and i'll throw his uh number and contact inf- information and all that in the description so cool thanks for tuning in guys thanks guys i've been southbound i've been hellbound riding on the midnight train Going too fast now, think I'll slow down Standing in the pouring rain